Get down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. Get down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. Get down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. Who's down with D and D? Who's down with D and D? Yeah, you know me. Get down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. I'm down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. Who's down with D and D? Are you ready to get down with some D&D? I know I am, and I am joined, as I am always joined, by the majestic, megalithic, and melancholy. Because it's Saturday on a uh, after Thanksgiving, and John has to go do something he does, he wants to do, but it's like, wow. Uh, Chris Nisa, yeah. but he's the Mad Wizard Merwin. I am. I am. I am awake. as I am probably a half hour more awake than Chris, which is probably saying something at this point. This is not unusual for us. We record on Saturday morning all the time now. It is. It is. And yet somehow we still all seem bleary. And But, you know, Chris, I think we'll be awake by the time we get into our news. Mm -hmm. By the way, that intro, sorry, everybody, that was not as good as I usually am. But we'll get better. We'll get better. We're going to come back strong now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so announcements. There's a new Unearthed Arcana. Yeah, it's pretty big news because it talks about psychic stuff. I mean, do you feel like Dark Sun might be right around the corner? Whenever psychic psionic psychic stuff is um discussed that is the first uh, avenue that people tend to look up because psionics are part and parcel with dark sun um so it it's possible mm -hmm. but but we've also seen psionics discussed for the last what three years through different articles yeah yeah we have and, and it's gone practically nowhere um in terms of anything official being released. It's true. So you never know. I mean, I feel like Dark Sun is the time that Psionics come to fruition. Yeah. I would, I would, that would make sense um, in terms of just mechanics of the game. Mm hmm. So in this article, the most interesting thing, and we're not going to talk about all of it, just a little bit of it, but the most mm -hmm. interesting thing is that Psionics is now an arcane tradition according to this playtest instead of its own thing. And I was like, what? A at mm -hmm. first. But then I didn't mind so much. I mean, I personally think it's not a bad idea to just reskin it and say, okay, it's like spell casting, so let's just make it spell casting with a different skin. Yeah. I mean, psionics over the years, we should, we'll t probably talk about this article maybe in a sneak attack down the road. Uh huh. Um, one of our sneak attack special uh, segments, but it, psionics have always been kind of a weird aspect of D&D, &D, going all the way back to like first edition AD&D. &D. Um, where it was just not, it was very exciting for people because it was so broken um, that everyone wanted to be psionic because you could just basically blow things up with your mind and nothing, there was nothing anyone could do about it. Which, um, which is like power gamey garbage. Yeah. And so if you don't like the fact that they are trying to make psionics um, either, you know, in, in some cases a a subclass of, of wizard or in other cases, a subclass of the other classes, right? You've got things like shard mind and, uh -huh. and psychic warrior and, yep. and those sorts of things. Um, if you don't like the way that they do that, guess what you can do? You can make your own. You can, you could put, you could put it up on drive through RPG. People have, <clears throat> and you could show everyone exactly what it should be. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the age we live in. Good luck with getting people to recognize it or notice it. Right. But sure, like you could totally do it yourself. Right, because it's very easy to say this is terrible, but it's very hard to say this is right a and show everyone what's right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it's interesting that they're going to do it this way. Um, let's see the feedback. Uh, and I think this is something best left discussed at a later date. Sure. Uh, one more thing, a couple of things, I suppose, mm -hmm. I wanted to mention about this before we move on. Yeah. There are some new spells on the back end of the article, yep. which are 5e versions of classic psionic spells, so that's mm -hmm. neat. And I, yep. I mean, personally, I think a lot of people are going to rebel against this because it's not what it was. Right. I hope if they do, Wizards of the Coast ignores those people, uh, mm -hmm. because I think this is probably the, the smoothest implementation of it. Right. All right, number two. Uh, the D and D movie had a uh, had a had a sighting. Like there was an article on comicbook.com, and it's to mm -hmm. focus on the Eye of Vecna supposedly, and will feature a forgot Forgotten Realms character. And yep. Sean, that Forgotten Realms character is Pelorandusk, which is the protector of the village of Irithimbul. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Irithimbul. That's, that's good. Yep. Um, and this is a dragon who concealed uh, who's concealing their true identity, a gold dragon, in fact. And their voice, their their casting. 
uh, a voice for that character, a male yep. voice. He was originally, the dragon was originally mentioned, I think, back in 1998, at least published for the first time back in 1998 in a Dragon Magazine article talking about dragons of the north, uh, north of Forgotten Realms, obviously. And so Irithimbul is near, like, Lelan, um near where, like, the starter set stuff takes place, um, you know, Fandelver, that area. Mm-hmm. So it will be interesting to see if that village comes into play. Yeah. Uh, and if it, if so, then we know that the the movie will be in the realms, or if using that name is just kind of paying homage to, to the realms. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really hoping... Actually, I'm not really hoping anything. I'm, I'm, I have no hope right now. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm in the same place. I. Whenever people start talking details of a D and D movie, I get wary because I have a feeling that any D and D movie that's made that hardcore D and D fans love is going to bomb. Uh, because I don't know anymore, man. Yeah, D and D is just a. It's a different thing, right? It's, it's, it's a game that's been around for a long time that many people have different ideas about, and for me, the fun of D and D is telling your own story. Uh huh. And seeing someone else's story, whether it's streamed or a movie or a book or a novel, it's really hard to. Um, to bridge that gap. You know, that's so funny that you say that because uh, I, I don't disagree with you. I think that is one of the purveying attitudes out there. Right. I also think that's the attitude of the older generation of people that played the game. Well, it's but it's also a generation that has seen several D&D movies fail badly. That, that's true. But those movies were bad. Like, just, the, as, the, just as stories, they were not right. good stories. Right. They, they were not good stories, but they weren't that different than some home games i've seen well yeah that's because there's a lot of bad home games out there it's it, the it, difference it, it, yeah sorry exactly. it's the difference between an independent comic book being published by somebody uh, right. off their own home press and somebody publishing like you know uh from hell like alan moore's from hell i mean right. i just took the literary extreme comic book thing to sure. somebody in their basement doing a thing right exactly but yeah it's i i i just and I'm not again streaming, right? I I've watched some streams. Uh, I I don't have the time to sit and watch many of them. Mm-hmm. And you know they're entertaining in in ways. Um, I just I fear, I fear. I want there to be a D and D movie that's awesome that people love that you know rivals the Lord of the Rings movies and, and all of that. I I want all that. Well, I mean, there's um, a good pedigree of people that are working on this thing. So I mean, that's I, that's positive. I, I, I understand. I just don't want their D and D fandom to get in the way of making a good movie. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, I think that's what it comes down to. I, th- that is one of the things I think is encouraging about the way that uh, Wizards of the Coast, at least, has has gone about their game, because they're right. so much more focused on telling better stories. True. Rather than putting together, I, I, honestly, I think the rule set is pretty quality because it's yeah. so flexible and open. But right. but their their focus is just definitely on on storytelling and mm-hmm. like. They hit it at the right time. They got lucky because a bunch of people started streaming games that were more about storytelling than the rules. Exactly. Exactly. And and so, you know, I want that luck to continue. Yeah. And I think, you know, that it's it's going to take a bunch of skill to make this movie both good and popular because you can have a great movie that's not popular or a popular movie that's not that great. That's true. And I want I want it all. I want it to hit. The big time, right? I want everyone to watch this movie and immediately want to go play Dungeons and Dragons. Well, there there is one number that we need to uh, to keep a track of when it comes out. We need to figure out how much it costs them to make this movie, mm-hmm. and then we need to see what the box office is worldwide. Because if the box mm-hmm. office is three to four times what it was to make, then it's mm-hmm. uh, it's a commercial success, and they'll make another one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there you so, go. Yeah. <laughs> and and so seeing like a a paragraph long version of the characters and stuff is terrifying as well Mm -hmm. because as a storyteller you know each character is deep should be deep and should have lots of stuff going on so when you see like and there's a half dragon named hat caraway i'm like oh boy that's where i went i was like huh yeah oh no uh so again I'm, i'm gonna hold judgment i'm just i'm there's trepidation 
coursing through my soul right now. Look, these character names are D&D-ish to the extreme. Exactly. When I saw that, I'm like, I don't know. But then I was yeah. like, I'm just going to not... I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do it. By the way, here are the names: They're a Raven Hightower, a warrior with a magic flame sword that's haunted by his sister's death. I mean, that's a pretty classic trope. Yeah. Um, uh, a half dragon named Hack Caraway. That's the one that made me cringe. I'm like, come on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, if you're gonna, be, I. That's like you can be tropey. Just don't be terrible about it. That, that character right. better be interesting. That's all I'm saying, right? Right. Um, a gnome thief named. Olivan Trickfoot. I mean, I don't think is Trickfoot a gnome name. That sounds like a halfling name. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like a yeah, yeah. a masked warrior named Alyssa Steel Song. I'm like that's D and D ish, and that's not too complex, right? Like, yeah. I mean, I can yeah. buy that one. That's fine. Yeah. Also, they're they're like in line to take over when Pelorandusk uh, dies, and I'm like, that's 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 a story, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Um, and the main villain of the movie is a male drow named Razor Horlbar, and I'm like. Uh, okay, I'm interested to see how they do that. That's like a yeah. a bit of a, a chance, right? Yeah. Um, and then Raven uh, and his uh, who once kept Raven, uh, who is the you know Raven and his sister, the assuming yeah. the main one of the main, if not the main character, and his sister who you know is haunted by the death of slaves. So that's like a instant rivalry thing going on there. So that's fine. Yep. And then there's a female Tifling, Damala. Which is fine. That name is fine. And then a British warrior known only as the Beast. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I don't know, man. Like, y- could you do better? Maybe. We'll find out, I guess. And and this is just rumor, too, right? Yeah, this we is just rumor. No so idea. who knows? Right. All right. Well, we spent way too much time on that, more than I really wanted to, but that's okay, because it's interesting, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's get into Descent Part 7, Chapter 3, Avernus. Hey, uh, you want to recap for us? Sure. So... So far, the adventurers have spent time in Baldur's Gate, learning that El Terrell was sent to Avernus due to some terrible deals that were made. Um, they met Lulu, a holophant, who travels with them to Avernus. When they arrived in Avernus, they uh, were in El Terrell, where they learned of the city's predicament. The city is slowly being dragged down into the River Styx by chains. And the second sun that El Terrell used to have above it, called the Companion, has been turned into a horrible dark void. Um, the survivors in the city are huddled together, and the city is so far not completely overrun by demons and devils. Uh, the characters then rescue Duke Ravengard and learn that the key to saving El Terrell might be in finding Zeriel's sword. So Lulu thinks that two Kenku named Chuka and Klonk might know where to start looking for the sword. And that's where we begin Chapter 3. So I am so, as far as our commentary on the book so far, I am so ready to get into Avernus. Like, we've been dancing around Avernus for seven yeah. levels now. Yep, and I think it's good. I think you need to. Um, I think it's been a good tease so far, and now it's time to get into the good stuff, mm-hmm. if you will. Uh, so let's talk about running the chapter. Sean, would you please mm-hmm. lead us into this? I certainly will. So the they give a... Uh, a rundown of what happens in this chapter, and they call it running this chapter, so let's run this chapter. So Chuka and Klonk are two Kenku who work for Mad Maggie, a hag warlord who operates out of Fort Knucklebone. Fort Knucklebone happens to be very near where El Terrell is being dangled over the River Styx. So th- these Kenku and Mad Maggie um, Build and repair infernal war machines out of Fort Knucklebone. Mm-hmm. So Lulu uh, regains memories uh, before Chapter 3 starts, leading the characters to Fort Knucklebone. And once Lulu gets there, she gets even more memories back. No, she, she has thinks, the opportunity to get more memories back. Right, right. She thinks she remembers the whereabouts of the Sword of Zeriel at, place, at a place called Harriman's Hill. Um, so when the characters get to Harriman Hill... Lulu realizes she made a mistake, so the characters have to deal with some creatures there, plus some hell wasps who kidnap Lulu. After dealing with the the perils at Harriman's Hill, the characters learn that there are two paths forward. They could take the path of demons or the path of devils. And each of these paths features locations that the characters must traverse to find the final location of the sword. Um, so, And also, at any time during this chapter, the characters might encounter the Wandering Emporium, uh, which is a dangerous but uh, helpful place, maybe, to the characters. Because, you know, it's basically a wandering village that has stuff for, to purchase. Mm-hmm. Run by a Roxasha. We talked about it a long yep. time ago. 
Yep. So at any point, you as the DM can bring the Wandering Emporium to the characters, basically. I love me the and, Wandering Emporium, by the way. Yep. At any time. Uh, Mahadi is a Rakshasa who runs this, and he could help them. He could help them and, or, or, and hurt them, or he could just try to destroy them, uh, depending on whatever choice you want to make as the DM. So once again, I find that this is a very solid introduction to a chapter in this book. It gives you an excellent sense of what to expect. Mm -hmm. So the next section of the book is called What is Avernus? So it basically gives a rundown of how to DM Avernus to make it flavorful, to make it work as the place, the setting that it is supposed to be in this adventure. Mm -hmm. um, so Avernus fills a few roles in the game. Most importantly, I think, it is the front line of the Blood War. So it is the place where the demons are coming through, coming out of the River Styx, into Hell, into Avernus. Mm -hmm. And so this whole place is being ravaged by this war. Uh, and that is an important motif throughout the rest of the adventure and really the only reason that the characters even have a chance to survive. Yeah, because otherwise they just get murdered. Yep. Or, or, you know, enslaved. Either way. Yep. So in terms of atmosphere, Avernus was once a false paradise that was used to tempt mortals. So whenever devils made a deal, they'd say, oh, look, look, you do what I, you do what I ask you, and, and this is your reward. And they would be shown kind of this false paradise where everything seemed great. Uh, but once they got there, they realized it wasn't quite what it what it was promised. Yeah. But now it is just a ruined hellscape, um, no pun intended, because of the blood war going on. So you see ruins everywhere of these fantastic cities that were once there um, used to tempt people now just in ruins. Yeah, this place was essentially a, a Dionysian Bacchanal 24-7, mm -hmm. and now it's not. Yep. yep. Although it still is a place... Not just where the wicked get punished, but it's where um, the wicked punish themselves. When you uh, are sent to Avernus because you have been a bad soul, um, it's not like you're getting the eternal flame damnation, you know, your feet being chopped off repeatedly. You know, it's not that sort of torturous place. It's a place where you're really allowed to torture yourself. You're allowed to continue your wicked ways just on a whole new level. So anyone who was evil because they sought power gets sucked right up into the old, I want more power, right? They they maybe come in as a lemur, and they now are trying to upgrade themselves into a spine devil. So their lives are just constant turmoil and constant striving for something. And it's constantly um, giving them those opportunities. Exactly. So it's it's a temptation, and it's a... a um, it's a punishment that fits the crime, and it's a punishment that is just more of the same. And this is important because, especially at Fort Knucklebones, when we get with Mad Maggie, like, she came here for a reason. And in essence, the characters are a temptation. Right. And, and they can take advantage of Mad Maggie because of her flaw, mm -hmm. right? Because of, the, of that sin that she has. Absolutely. Um, uh, there's a so really, that's, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, there's a really nice flow chart in this section, too, that mm -hmm. is a visual version of uh, what we already talked about with the chapter and its options. Yep. Um, the next part of Adventuring in Avernus is Zeriel's War. So it gives the background that Zeriel plans uh, to bring evil beings to Avernus to turn them into devils to restock her troops. So Zeriel doesn't want to bring people here just to kill them, right? She just she is out there, and her minions are out there recruiting to you know offer up contracts to people. And after you know, we give you your gold, we give you your power, we give you whatever you want. When you die, you come to us, and you become an ar uh, a soldier in Zeriel's army. Yeah, and this is um, important to note too, because Zeriel and the devils they're eternal beings. Like, yep. they have some amount of patience that they can wait. But in this particular adventure, they're running low on people for the Blood War. Mm -hmm. So they need a faster infusion of devils. Yes. And so the people from El Torel who signed the Creed Resolute, not knowing what they were doing, 
are now honor-bound and infernally contracted to assist Zariel in the blood war. Um, and this is something I think you mentioned it maybe a, two or three episodes ago that is a little underplayed in the adventure, um, and it could be played up more. Uh, so if you're a citizen of El Jorel, you, had to sign, you have to sign this creed basically when you become old enough to be a citizen. And even though you didn't know what you were signing, what you were saying was, hey, when I die, I go down and I fight against demons. And it all sounds good, except you realize that you're now a devil or working for devils. Yeah, yeah, it's bad. And so what I would have loved to have seen is during the chapter two part where the characters are in El Torel, having some of the citizens there like turn into devils or just get sucked away and down into the battle. Um, just to give a little more um, push to the characters to act quickly or to see the stakes that we have here. Yeah, that's important. Like, I don't know what the um, – if they're going to – we haven't – I've read the whole book yet, right? Like, we're, we're going by this beat by beat, blow by blow. Right. Like, it, if they don't raise this stake later, uh, there's a option to re redeem Zeriel. Like, if you don't redeem Zeriel and you get Eltrail back – in the prime material plane, who cares? Because everybody who signed the creed resolute still screwed. Yes. Yep. So it is. It is something that I wish they would have pushed a little more because it is a very strong beat. Um, that is, you know, Chris. This is the difference between a a movie and a good movie, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, a, a regular movie is oh this happens and there's all this fighting and you know CGI stuff blowing up and yay, whereas you know, if they if you go one step further and you show this deep um, trauma and this contract that was signed and show the actual uh, results of it, then it becomes more powerful. Very much so. I mean, that's that that turns it from being just like we're adventurers doing adventure things to like, oh, we should probably save this city. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that so it, if you haven't run uh that yet, if you haven't run El Torel chapter yet, do that. Have one of or more of the people, maybe one per day, turning into a a spine devil and flying down, uh, forgetting who they are, flying down and joining the 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 battle. By the way, the perfect moment to have that happen is when they get to the uh the high hall and they find those 100 people huddled together. Yep. If one of them changes, then yep. right in the middle of all of that, right. Especially if they're confused after they change, like yep. they might have just turned into a devil, but they're not. Their their mind's not gone or anything or anything like that. They're still right. who they are, right? Or have it show a conflict, right? A, an in, internal conflict where the person is fighting it and they finally succumb to it. Mm -hmm. Or have all uh, those people that are down there slowly changing into spine devils because they're yep. now in Avernus, and yep. then you can have uh, the what's that priestess's. Or a priest's yeah. name. Yep. But they Feria. Can, yeah, Feria. Feria, yep. Feria can be like, oh, oh no, this thing's a contract. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So there you go. All right. Uh, the next part is called the Features of Avernus, where the DM can learn about ways to make this setting different from other settings. Oh, can I talk about this? Yes, please do. All right. So if you want some elements for storytelling, this part is pretty fantastic. It's three paragraphs. But it might be worth it to make a list of those elements and then, you know, paste it to your DM screen or somewhere in a notepad mm -hmm. file on your digital device that you're running your game from. Uh, if you if you're a subscriber to uh, our Patreon and you get the show notes, I have that list. So you can just copy it and paste it if you don't feel like doing it yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. Here's the list real quick. Uh, meteors streaking across the sky and crashing to the ground. Constant twilight, hideous clouds, smells of brimstone and burning tar, hot gusts of wind, immense sandstorms form that are very dangerous, swarms of flies, hell wasps, and sturges, they blacken the sky times, they are also very dangerous. There are bands of nuperbios, those are that are living lakes of groaning flesh. By the way, nuperbios are these huge fat demons. They're essentially gluttony manifested. Mm -hmm. um, there are bone fields, there's quicksand, there's bubbling tar pits, there's lakes of lava, there's canyons of wailing souls, and there's salt flats made from the tears of the damned. Yeah. Like you do. Yeah. So, like, you just take that, put it somewhere around, and then when they're wandering around Avernus, you don't have to use mm -hmm. all of them at once, but you can use, like, one or two of them at a time when they're traveling around. Yep. And show a creature, you know, wandering through some plane, and all of a sudden a swarm of sturges just can bulge on them and, and <laughs> suck all their blood out, and 
then leave, and there's just like this dried out husk of a person there. It's even better um, if it's something not unpowerful, right? Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, so there's all that. Then, of course, there's the River Styx that courses through Avernus, and the River Styx does not act like a normal river, so it changes course frequently, making it a terrible way to navigate. So, if someone says, "Oh, just follow the river." One time you follow the river, it'll take you one place. You could follow the river a second time and end up in a completely different place. Um, not to mention drinking from or entering the river. You do not want to do that. It um, is a it bad idea. A DC 20 save versus the Feeble Mind spell. Um, for those who don't know, the Feeble Mind spell basically turns you into a blithering idiot for 30 days. And if you do not make a save at the end of those 30 days, it becomes permanent. Uh, you basically become uh, unable to think on your own. That's what happened to Lulu. Yes, at least partially. Uh, now, if you know as a DM what players will do, oh, the river sticks. I'm going to take water out of the river sticks and use this as a weapon. Um, well, m most demons and devils are immune to this, uh, and if it's taken out of the river, it loses its potency after 24 hours. So... Uh, Characters can try to use it as a weapon, but it probably won't work after a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, spells have different effects in uh, in Avernus. It used to be that sp there was a huge list, and you know each spell would have some sort of different outcome if it was cast here. Now they've kind of tamped that down a little bit. Um, s spells, a lot of the time, will just have a cosmetic change. That's pretty um, much all of it, right? Like, yeah. Um, the the like of the big beast hand will turn into a claw instead of a hand. I mean, it's so cool, right? It is. I mean, I, I love all of it. The uh, the other another one is find the path. Find the path spell. An, an imp appears instead these days and begrudgingly guides the caster to the desired location while complaining the whole time, Dis yep. disappearing when the destination is reached or the spell ends. Like that's a fun spell now. Like it's not just yep. like oh I'm going to walk the path that I can see. It's like oh look I have this NPC that's going to be annoying. Mm -hmm. And using that, uh, this list as a guide, you can, every spell that's cast could come up with something. Like even Magic Missile, right? The missiles could be screaming imps or, uh, you know, some sort of horrible dripping talons or, rather than just a bolt of energy. Well, it's the nice thing about just saying it's it's reskinned a little instead of, like, redone. Yeah. Exactly. Like, it's just, it's just a, uh, it's a just, it's not even a trapping, it's just a skin on top of it. Yep. Now... Some magic is a little bit changed. For example, if you cast any sort of spell that uses telepathic communication, or if you can use it naturally, um, archdevils can eavesdrop on you. Now, this is a big deal, and it's something yes. to watch for as a, as a dungeon master. I mean, it, especially if you want to expand upon the adventure, or you want a reason for your bad guys to know what the PCs are up to, because, mm -hmm. hmm, these heroes are running around now causing trouble. Let's see what they're up to, and if we can't lure them to our side. Mm -hmm. So that's important. And there's also a substance called demonic ichor. Um, it is very dangerous. When a demon is killed, it leaves its ichor behind. Um, and if any uh, creature, living creature touches it, it could become warped unless they make a DC 10 con constitution saving throw. Now, and the, these aren't yeah. small changes, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some of them are actually positive even though they're sort of grotesque uh -huh. uh, some of them are horribly negative um, and they can be removed with a uh, remove curse I mean you can you can your arms and your legs can switch positions yeah yeah that one's awful <laughs> pretty much but you could also get wings and yeah. they could be feathery or leathery so you know mm -hmm. yeah um, so you know there's a there's a chart you can roll on and Again, you know, it's it's cool. It's good stuff. I'm not a big fan of characters getting benefits from it, um, but, you know, whatever. Whatever floats your boat. Um, there is a commerce sidebar. I, you wanna... I love this sidebar. It's important because of uh, one statement in it. It says, in Avernus, the business is war. So that means if you as a dungeon master are ever at a loss to do uh, for what to do or think about how a devil can benefit themselves for, from a situation. You know, just think about how can they benefit from the war and how do they want the war to benefit them because if they get a positive out of it, they look better in Zeriel's eyes or whoever they're working for under Zeriel to advance. Mm -hmm. 
And that is a exactly. that's a thing. This this place yep. is a war torn land, and it's constantly at war. Yep. And characters can also take advantage of that if a devil is looking to benefit. Right. Mm-hmm. There's there's so, chances to make deals all over the place. Yep. Um, if the characters are wandering around in Avernus, um, any survival checks they make are made at disadvantage. And they can still find uh, portable water and edible food, but it's disgusting. So they can survive. It's just not pleasant. Yeah, it's uh, it's gross, but that's okay. And then they, and then they they give three optional rules. Uh, the first optional rule is if you fail a death saving throw, a devil appears and telepathically tries to make a deal with you. So you're unconscious if you're making death saves, most likely. Um, but in your mind, you hear a devil saying, "Hey, I can help you out." All you need to do is blank, and they give you whatever task they need performed. Um, if you take this deal, you are geezed to perform the task. You must perform the task. But your next death save is a natural 20, meaning you get back up. Mm-hmm. Uh, another optional rule is non-evil creatures um, treat overland travel as a forced march, which means for every hour you travel, you need to make a DC 10 uh, constitution saving throw. Plus one for every hour you've traveled so far without rest. So it starts at DC 11, then goes to 12, then goes to 13 until you rest. And each time you fail, you gain a level of exhaustion. So that can get really rough really, really quickly. Yes, yes, it can. It can be a, a pretty big drain on your resources. If you want that that old school where traipsing mm-hmm. around in a giant dungeon feel, that's the rule to use. Yep. And then as they become exhausted, they will lead to sleep, which will bring encounters or bring devils saying, hey, you look tired. How about this? This will take care of your exhaustion if you drink it, but here's what I need. Mm-hmm. Um, the last optional rule is non-evil creatures basically turn lawful evil if they stay here too long. Um, and then, you know, the, It's a slow process, but it, it happens. Um, the spell, the spell good and evil, can return people to their original alignment. Uh, I actually think this is pretty bad. Like, yeah, me too. Like, I don't like this rule at all. There's a different... Nope. And, and I'm not just going to be the person that sits here and says, that's stupid, don't use it. Uh, if I was going to use this kind of um, alignment shifting mechanic, I would start with uh, imposing, after a period of time, disadvantage on anyone not lawful either when they made a wisdom, intelligence, or charisma saving throw or skill check. Mm-hmm. Uh, that Because that shows, like, that there's a corrupting influence that is pushing on them mechanically. Uh, but it's not changing their character sheet. It's just imposing some some disadvantage in certain situations. Yep. What I would do is just add flaws, right? We have a nice flaw section on your character sheet. Um, add flaws. You know, you get you get you get grouchy. You're grouchy all the time. Mm-hmm. You get um, you know you get sarcastic. You're sarcastic all the time. Yeah. Um, and and just let the flaw right. It's it's like the Lord of the Rings, right? There, whoever holds the ring starts to be affected by it. What does the flaw do though in the game? Like it can get you inspiration, but what else does it do that's problematic? Well, it it really doesn't do anything. It's it's a role playing thing. Well, sure, right. but I mean, if you want to have it have some sort of mechanical impact, also with the game, like that's to me, those are the best mechanics. Mechanics that also have a mechanical impact. Otherwise, yeah. they're okay. yeah yeah. Like I, I think that's fine. Like if you want to use the flaw, and actually that flaw does have a mechanical impact because if you play up your flaw, you can get inspiration. Get sure, but that's that's saying here's a negative, but you're going to get a positive from it. Right. I like doing the flaw. I like doing like the the flaws and those role playing sorts of things rather than alignment, because alignment, as we have talked about many many times here, is really a terrible game mechanic. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's used as an excuse for players to act like idiots um, yeah. it's used an excuse for games to be ruined um, and the people say well I'm just being my alignment use the flaw right it's the same thing but it doesn't have this weight that this alignment does um, to to make people do horrible things so I might also think of putting in this idea of a three strike policy against characters and their choices but not tell mm-hmm. them what choices they make cost them a strike or mm-hmm. two. Uh, okay. I might even make some of the choices worth more, like I said, more than one strike if they're truly evil. And this is a place that's lawful evil, so rationalizing evil choices for the greater good is pretty much the lawful evil handbook of villainy. Right. Um, of course, you should probably get buy-in from your players before instituting this rule. Mm-hmm. That's what I would do. And to uh, to take it one step further with what we talked about earlier, like they didn't sign 
a uh, the Creed Resolute or anything like that, but they're an Avernus. So as they mm-hmm. start acquiring these these strikes, they mm-hmm. start getting um, some of those mutations or like not not mutations exactly, but like they start changing. Right. Like the 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 evil starts manifesting on them. Mm-hmm. That could be bad for a paladin. Yes, it could. Especially if that paladin isn't is any alignment that isn't lawful evil. Mm-hmm. And if you're running this for say the Adventures League, evil characters uh, are not allowed, right? So I would not use it because if they turn lawful evil, there's a chance that they just they are then retired. Uh, so you don't want to do. that. Oh, here and here you go, man. If you want me to tie this into your flaw mechanic, so the flaws um, essentially push them to doing less good things role playing wise, right? Mm-hmm. So you can award them inspiration for playing to their flaws, but they can also gain these strikes from playing mm-hmm. up those flaws. Right. And uh, start changing. So then they have to, like, start really making choices because it will, it if, like, their their choices aren't just an internal battle for their soul, but an internal battle for their soul that's actually externally focus, uh, manifesting. Mm-hmm. I think that would be, it's a fascinating yeah. idea to put in there. Uh, it's all optional, though, so you don't have to. But if you if you want right. something... That is about right. battling the corrupting influence of Avernus. Like that's yeah. those are there's better ways to do it than what was presented. Right, and I'll depend. You know, if your characters are heavily into the role playing, then you you want to give them that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Whereas if they're not, it's pretty moot anyway. So, uh, let's talk about the poster map for a second. Yep. So there's a great poster map of Avernus in the book. Uh, El Terrell and Fort Knucklebone are not on the map. Uh, the distances in Avernus are impossible to gauge. So don't take the map literally. Uh, it is a you know firsthand drawing of a pretty confused person who is just t- trying to go by memory. And since the landscape can change anyway, uh, it's a cool map. But again, don't take it literally. Uh, the one cool thing about the map is it uh, talks. It does. So the first time a the characters arrive in a certain area, the map will reveal a clue. Um, about that location. I don't know what that means in game terms, because that's all it says. It just says reveals clues. Uh, but there you go. So, and you can roll dice to figure out if the characters end up in the right place. If they're using the map to guide themselves, um, when they arrive somewhere, you roll dice, and there's a chance that they will actually end up in an incorrect place based on whether they've been there before if they have a guide or if they're just hoofing it on their own. Yeah, and it's a, it's really a, a solid uh, mechanical setup. So, like, it's mm-hmm. if you've never been there, you roll 2d4, and if the numbers match, you don't end up where you wanted to go. Right. Um, if it's you've been there before, it's a d8, 2d8. If it's if you have a guide, it's two it's 2d10. And that's the same mechanic applies. Right. It's, if the number matches, then you did not show up where you wanted to show up. Yeah, so basically a 25% chance, right? Hey. Mm-hmm. Uh, or a ten percent chance if you have a guide. Mm-hmm. Uh, the um, the I like this a lot because you can put Fort Knucklebones and El Terrell wherever you want on the map. In fact, you're encouraged to do so. Mm-hmm. And because they're like really near each other, um, and I love that it talks. Like that's just mm-hmm. it's like it's got that a bunch really of magic cool. mouth spells on it, right? That trigger when you get near a place. Yep. And it's you know it's totally dicey to get where you want to go. Yeah. There's my pun for the day. There you go. Hmm. It is dicey. Uh-huh. Uh, we got about. We got, I don't know if we can get through Fort, Fort Knucklebones in five minutes. We should still talk about it, though, right? A little okay. bit. We'll, we'll just get into the... We'll, the over... we'll, see, we'll see what we can do. Yeah. So, like, I, I like Fort Knucklebones a lot. Uh, I think you do, too, right? Yeah. yeah. I think it's a cool place. Um, so the characters go there because Lulu thinks that, that someone there can help her regain her memories or at least point them in the right direction. Uh, so they get to there, and this whole encounter... There, there are, you can have several encounters in Fort Knucklebone, but the whole idea of it is you are trying to get Mad Maggie, who runs Fort Knucklebone, uh, she's a hag, on their side. And rather than doing it as either a skill, a, like a super tight skill challenge or too loose a thing, what the adventure uh, asks you to do is think of this whole thing on a scale of 1 to 10. Um, one being a horrible failure, ten being a great success. The characters start at five, where they're not loved by Mad Maggie, they're not hated by Mad Maggie, but they have something she wants, which is Lulu's memories. Uh, Mad Maggie loves misery, and she came to Avernus to collect misery. 
and she immediately heard about Zariel's fall, and she couldn't think of anything more miserable than that. So she collects Zariel's memorabilia. If you <laughs> it's will. so funny, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's a collector, right? She's a she's a super cool collector, mm -hmm. and uh, so. The, the, so it talks about in the in the adventure. It talks about having leverage. Yes, right? and Lulu and is of leverage. Deals, <laughs> yep, and Lulu is the leverage. So the characters have the leverage of Lulu, which is why Mad Maggie is willing to put up with their presence. Um, starting again at a five on a scale of one to ten, and then there are things the characters can do in Fort Knucklebone to either raise or lower that score. Mm -hmm. And it's not a hard and fast. Go up one if you do this. It's just getting a feel for it. And so at the end of the their time in Fort Knucklebone, they will have either gained or lost points on that scale, and then you can decide how how much they get out of their stay there. Yep. If they if they end up at a ten, they're gonna get everything they wanted, right? They might come away with an infernal war machine and all the information and you know, a week's worth of food and information if they end up with a one they might have to actually fight their way out and just barely know what they're doing next yeah so why don't we, we we've kind of introduced fort knucklebone i'd really like to dig into it next time because there's it's fascinating how they've structured it and because we've had dungeon after dungeon after dungeon and now we're getting something that's very different in structure yep that sounds like a plan we will Dig deep into Fort Knucklebone next time. And maybe talk about some Infernal War Machines, because that's the next yeah. thing that happens. Sounds good. All right. Well, thank everybody for listening to this episode of Down With D&D. Let's do a few Patreon shout-outs now. Uh, Kevin Lovecraft, the Royal Beard. Merrick Blackman, our Royal D&D reviewer. Mike Dinos, the Inquisitor of Mark. P.K. Sullivan, who's our Queen's Royal Rocketeer. Richard Wyatt, the Captain of the Royal Airship Fleet. Rob Abrazado, the Gauntlet of the Fist and our Chief. Uh, Schmitty, the Keeper of the Labyrinth. Toby Sennett, the Baron of Britannia. Todd Crapper, the Prophet of Probability and the Best Name in Gaming. And Craig, the Lord of One Name. And if you'd like to be a patron of Down With D&D, you can click on the link to our Patreon page on the website, and for $2 a month, you can get yourself a shout-out. Not quite like the one you just got, got like was given out, but one similar to that. Mm -hmm. Or for $4 a month, you not only get a shout-out, you also get to see our pre-production show notes, which were nine pages this week. Um, and you also get access to our Slack room, where you can chat with us whenever you want. Or for just one single dollar per month. One dollar? Just one dollar, Chris. You can have access to our extras show called Sneak Attack. Sneak Attack, and that's like fifteen where we, minutes, four times a month. Yep, we. That's a full hour. Well, yeah, a full hour over the month of extra content that we discuss. Sean, let me do that one more time. So, fifteen plus fifteen plus fifteen plus fifteen is one hour of content a month for a dollar. That is true for only one dollar, Chris. Man, we can math you really can, hard, can't we? We can. <laughs> I mean, that sounds like a good deal to me. Plus, you get I, plus you get the if you if you don't just like D and D and you like everything else on this director mark, you get the pandas talking games uh, bonus outtakes, which is funny, mm -hmm. and you also get the the after show for misdirected mark Productions. So that's really forty five times four. That's three hours of extra content a month. Yeah, uh, for just a dollar. Mm -hmm. um, All right. So you know, if you can't help us monetarily, but you want to give us a boost, you can do so with an Apple Podcast review. Yep, those help us even if you're not listening via Apple Podcast because other podcatchers use Apple Podcast to rate and rank shows. And, you know, a nice five-star rating would make us visible, and we appreciate that. But you can also just share our links and talk about the show uh, on your social media. Yeah, we love people who talk about the show, like Larry Heldon, who constantly lets people know that he's been listening to us. We love it. Yeah, yeah. And we might even, like, mention your name like we just did. Yeah, I, I met Larry down in, uh, down in Florida. Yeah? Super awesome guy and a great DM. Seems like a super awesome guy. I've seen some of his yeah. like little mini videos that he that he posts now and again. Oh yeah, um, Sean, where can we find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Sean Merwin, or you can go to the Misdirected Mark forums at forums.misdirectedmark.com. How about you, Chris? So I am at the Light One Hundred and One on Twitter. You can also go to at Misdirected Mark on Twitter. That is another great place to get a hold of me or Sean. Uh, the, the forums is probably the best spot. But you can leave comments on the website. We always get them. Um, if you are looking for other things, you can go to our Twitch channel. Like, we have actual plays and the Misdirected Mark podcast on there. Uh, if you want this show not on any of the podcatcher platforms, you prefer to listen to us on YouTube because you have YouTube Premium, we are on YouTube these days. So you can go there mm -hmm. also. 
then there's a bunch of other great shows on there too. There's 10 shows I think these days. And one of them is called yeah. the bonus experience. That's where Ray and Monica, two old friends, they explore gameplay and design through the lens of diversity. And they also share some of the dumbest humor gaming has to offer. Mm -hmm. Down with D and D is a misdirected Mark production, the media arm of encoded designs. So Sean, mad wizard Merwin, what are we going to do now? We are going to go kill some monsters. You're down with D and D. Yeah, you you down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. You down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. Who's down with D and D? You down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. You down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. I'm down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. Who's down with D and D? Yeah, you know me.